kids, Miss Block here. Today, we are going to explore our Age of the Earth unit by examining relative age and correlation. While we're reviewing during this video, you want to make sure that you have your notes handy with you. I have mine right here and your reference table. As always, you can pause, rewind, and review anything in this video multiple times in case you didn't get it the first time. Are you ready? Let's get started. So, the present is the key to the past. What exactly does this phrase mean? Well, if we were to look at the time that the Earth has been in existence as a clock or a 24-hour clock, so one day, humans have only been around for a short period of time. In fact, we only showed up during the last couple of seconds of that 24-hour day. So we need to rely on what we see today. And this is outlined under the principle of uniformitarianism. I know, that's a super long word. And what the principle of uniformitarianism states is that processes that shape the Earth's surface today also happened in the past, which allows us to make inferences as to what has taken place in Earth's history. So the processes that are shaping the Earth's surface today, such as plate tectonics, and all those tectonic activities and the surface processes such as the agents of erosion with running water and glacial processes, those processes that have shaped the earth today also happened in the past and making observations about those factors right now allows us to make out inferences what happened in the past because none of us were around when some of these things happened. You know, none of us are 4.6 billion years old. That's really old. So we can date the Earth two ways. One way is through a tech, an idea called relative age. And relative age is basically how old a fossil or rock is compared to other fossils and rocks. So it's a comparison. We look at the things around it. It doesn't give us a numerical value. That would be under absolute age. An absolute age is a numerical age of a particular rock or fossil. So that would tell you the exact number. I love this diagram right here because it compares the two. So if you look at the picture on top right here, we can see relative age. And we have a family of some children, and we can see that we're comparing those children to their siblings. So we're comparing the siblings, and we can see we have the oldest, the intermediate, and the youngest. We're not giving any numbers, so we're saying, you know, these children here, they're older than the younger child, so they would maybe be, in comparison, the older brothers to that one and then we have the oldest right here on the left and this right here would say okay the would be younger compared to the oldest so it's all comparisons likewise at the bottom we have that absolute age which is giving us values of 21 years eight years and four years what we're going to focus on today is relative age all right so there's a few things we need to know and understand when we're discussing relative age. And one of them is the law of original horizontality. And that basically states that rocks are originally deposited in horizontal layers. If these layers are altered by some sort of event, this event must have occurred after the layer formation. All right? The horizontal layers, or originally formed in horizontal layers, shows up right in our definition right here. Okay, so all the layers will originally form in these nice horizontal ways. Okay, so we have three layers right here, all horizontal, okay, going across. We can then alter them or change them. So they can be tilted. So the tilting is altering those layers. So the tilting had to happen afterwards. That event is younger. We can have the folding. The folding must have happened after those three layers. So the folding would be younger than everything. We can also have faulting, okay, or the rocks can break, all right, and shift along a crack. Since the fault is going through all three layers, we know that the fault had to happen after those layers were deposited. We can also have igneous intrusions and contact metamorphism cut through or bisect through our various layers. So in this case, we have deposition of our various rocks. So we have three rock layers right here. Then what can happen is we have the faulting. So in this case, okay, the fault, like we just discussed, would be younger than these three layers. But then we can have an igneous intrusion represented by this orange mark right here. The igneous intrusion is bisecting or cutting through, all right, 
everything here, including the fault, which allows us to know that the igneous intrusion is younger than each one of these layers. All right, and this is illustrated by this diagram right here. Okay, this igneous intrusion is younger than all the layers that it cuts through. We can also then see that now we have more faulting. So since this fault cuts through the igneous intrusion, that fault is actually younger than the intrusion itself. You also want to make sure that you note if there's no contact metamorphism, then the intrusion is younger than the rock it is touching. So let me show you what that means. So in this diagram right here, I have a granite intrusion and contact metamorphism indicated by these dashed lines outlining the intrusion. So in this instance, since I have contact metamorphism between the granite and the schist, the schist must have been there before the granite intrusion. So the schist is older than the granite. However, between the shale and the granite, there is no contact metamorphism. We don't see this symbol present there. As a result, the granite must have been there prior to the shale. So as a result, the shale is younger than the granite and the schist is older. Now we can also see present unconformities, and it's a buried erosional surface that represents a gap in the rock record. So the way that unconformities form is that you would have deposition of your sediments underwater in the formation of your sedimentary rocks. This has to take place underwater. After they've been deposited, you're going to have uplift. We need to have okay, that erosion and weathering take place above the surface, so we have it uplifted. It's pushed up. We then have erosion take place. All right? It is weathered and broken down. Those sediments are carried away by erosion. Then flooding takes place, and more. we can have more formation of sedimentary rocks. All right? And then we have this unconformity right here. An unconformity is usually indicated by a wavy or squiggly line, but sometimes it's not. So you need to look and see if there's any tilting that has taken place or anything of that nature. If we look in this diagram right here, you can see that we have an unconformity right here along A, A prime. This dark line is representing our unconformity. So we have these layers that are tilted and then they were weathered, as well as this igneous intrusion. Now, another factor that we need to keep in mind when discussing relative age is the law of superposition. And that says that the rock layers on the bottom are older than the layers on top, providing that the rock layers have not been flipped or overturned. So as long as the layers are one on top of another, okay, the oldest one will be on the bottom, the youngest on top. Kind of like if you have a laundry hamper and you haven't done your laundry all week, the clothes you wore earlier in the week will be at the bottom of that hamper and the clothes that you wore most recently would be at the top. All right, so if we look at this diagram right here, we can see that the oldest rocks are on the bottom and the younger are on top. So the deeper we dig, the farther back in time we can see. All right, again, just goes without saying, though, if you have that igneous intrusion and it cuts through the, those layers, that's going to be younger. So it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, this is on top, this is the youngest. Make sure you take a note of that igneous intrusion with contact metamorphism. Now, sometimes we have all these events and we're able to sequence as or put them in order as to what happened first, second, third, first, and so on and so forth. However, sometimes we want to be able to compare or match up our similar rock types and geologic events and fossils from one location to another. So we'll use a technique called correlation. And this is the process of showing that rocks and geologic events from different places are approximately the same age. Now, there are several techniques that we can use, but these are the three that we focused on in our class. One is using similar rock types. So you would go and look at the outcrop or exposed rock, exposed bedrock, and you would try to match up similar rock types and patterns, just like here. So if you look right here, we're able to go and look and say, hey, this limestone here matches up to this limestone, this gray shale to here. This sandstone to here, we have a similar pattern right here, which indicates that these rocks must have been formed at the same time, so they must be around the same age. 
Another aspect we can use is a volcanic ash deposit. So when a volcanic volcano erupts, it will widely disperse a rapid, it will rapidly disperse a wide amount of volcanic ash. And it's great because it's a singular event and it spreads a lot. So it happens during a very short period of time over a wide area. So if we look in this diagram here, we have three outcrops and we're able to use volcanic ash to help us correlate. You can see right here we have volcanic ash right here, we have volcanic ash right here, and volcanic ash right here as well. So we can not only use the similar rock types, like the tan limestone, green shale, great siltstone, look, it shows up over here, and it also shows up over here. We can use that to help us match it up and correlate the volcanic ash and the rock types. Our last item that we can look at are index fossils. And index fossils are an organism that has a widespread geographic distribution but existed for a short period of time. We're going to discuss index fossils at length in some upcoming videos. So next, in our next topic within this unit, we're going to talk about um, Earth's history and index fossils and the New York State index fossils. This is, though, probably the best item that we can use to help us figure out correlation and they have the matching with our index fossils. Make sure you know it has widespread geographic distribution, can be found everywhere on Earth, but it only existed for a short period of time as a species, not just an individual one, but that organism as a whole's existence. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Again, you can rewatch it and review it on any concepts that you might have had trouble on. Please come to Extra Help and ask questions especially if you have trouble sequencing the events. Take care and have a great day. Bye-bye.